This is Tax Pro Nation, the home of independent tax professionals. Find community, maximize your earnings, and live life on your own terms. I'm your host, Jeff Dolan, Vice President of Pronto Tax School. And I'm your co-host, Andy Fry, founder and CEO of Pronto Tax School. As a tax professional, you take pride in giving the best service you can to every client you serve. Too often, your good work goes unnoticed. Too often, your story goes untold. No more. Unnoticed and untold ends now. Welcome to season two, the season of story, where it's all about recognizing and appreciating you, the hardworking tax professionals that inhabit the mysterious land known as Tax Pro Nation. In this episode, we're going to hear from Beth Lynn Kelly. She is our Shining Star Award winner from the 2020 My Tax Career Story Contest. And she is a lawyer turned actress turned tax pro for 11 years. This is a very fun conversation. We cannot wait for you to hear it. Let's jump in. Hey, Beth. How are you? I'm good. Hey, glad, Beth. Glad to be on. It's Andy here. He, is, he, is he there with you physically? Um, yes. We're, we're here physically <laughs> in like a, it's almost like a pre-COVID environment where we're in the same room. We're socially distanced. <laughs> If, if I watch TV at this point, people go to hug and I'm like, no. And I'm like, no, okay, they can do that. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. How's it going? Good. You know, I still, my tax season didn't end. No. I don't know about you guys. I pushed the last extension button at 1159 on that Wednesday, July 15th. I usually have 10 people extend. I had 42 extensions. Wow. So four times I as many. I have never... I've never done more than 10, and I had 42. Wow. And so then that weekend, everybody decided, well, now that I don't have pressure, I'm going to get everything done. <laughs> so then, like, the next week, everybody was like, okay, well, when can you finish me? I'm like, okay, well, you're in line. Crazy. So, Beth, you, do, you focus on corporate tax returns, correct? No, I actually am transitioning. I actually have been done personal tax returns for pretty much ex- exclusively small businesses at this point. A lot of people in the entertainment industry, gig workers, but I kind of transitioned. I started doing um, entertainment people because I was in Screen Actors Guild and that's where I kind of started doing taxes. But then, you know, uh, the industry's changed because a lot more work is going on union. There's not as many actors now. They don't make the same kind of commercials anymore. And basically in like 2000, I want to say like, eight, nine, when the recession happened, a lot of people just couldn't make a living at it. So I've been, while I work, you know, over 20 years, I started noticing that, you know, all these people that used to be able to make a full living at it, now we're making a third of the money. Mm, So it just started transitioning into people owning their own small businesses, graphic designers, makeup artists, like people who, you know, things that were still in demand, they still have a little bit of my original client base, but I don't have easy tax returns. <laughs> like, I don't have anybody who, who just sends me stuff and, you know, oh, yeah, this will take you 10 minutes. I don't have those people. I thought um, you were going to say you transitioned after this tax season. <laughs> uh, well, I actually, I have to tell you, I am so good at personal taxes and I, and I know so much about them. It's very hard to wrap your brain around, like I did, I have done corporate taxes this year. Last year, I did Andy's course, uh, well, sorry, Pronto course, um, that <laughs> Andy just happened to be on it a lot, um, that, uh, of, for corporate taxes. And I was like, okay, this doesn't seem all that much different than what I'm doing for Schedule C clients. And, but I have to admit, my people are all going to be basic, right? In terms of what corporate taxes are. They're not going to be multi-million dollar corporations, right? Right. And I'm not looking at someone who's going to be making more than $250,000, right? So I don't really have to worry so much. But I'm one of those weirdos that really, no, you need to balance your books. I need to know what's going on. No, 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 you're not guessing. This is not a personal tax return anymore. <laughs> right. So. Yeah, it's, it's weird with, uh, with those, you know, the corporation and LLC clients, right? Because the... Even if it's a smaller business, the accounting is such a disaster that if when you have a, uh, you know, you want to do it correctly, it can be very, actually very difficult to deal with those smaller companies. And I think that's kind of what, what, what we ran into a little bit, um, you know, in your first forays into the corporate and partnership adventure, right? Yes, I, it's, 
it's crazy how many people, you know, incorporate and don't have any guidance or even people, I've had a couple people who had someone do their taxes in the past and people, these big companies, CPA companies who, you know, I don't know if because, you know, it's tacked on to one of the, uh, you know, the partners of the LLC has other work for the firm. So they're like, oh, well, we're doing this for less money. So we're just going to kind of do it, you know, half-assed, I it was, guess. It but was Johnny's first ass- day. <laughs> yeah, give it to the intern. <laughs> yeah, the intern's first day. <laughs> well, and it's, it's crazy to me because one of mine, for example, I, it's funny for, I wrote Andy so many notes. I was like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, maybe I'm not going to help this. Holy moly. My first one was their original accountant never asked them questions about how the partnership was going to work. So how it was supposed to work was one person gave six grand and the other person uh, as starter money and the other person was going to take the money every year until they got to a certain point, right? Oh, no, they just spread everything equally, didn't give him a salary, nothing. I mean, it was crazy. And I and I was like, okay, well, now it looks like they have all this money in the bank account, which doesn't exist. That's a problem. And it was weird. It was weird. Yeah, and it gets weird quick. It, <laughs> well, it's just that they didn't ask so many questions. They just didn't, they were like, okay, we're just going to do it like a normal, you know, just divide it the way we always would. And okay, no, but that wasn't their intent at all. So it's just one of those things where you say, if you'd asked two or three questions, this wouldn't have happened. And now we're four years in, and what? And then I have another one, a movie, uh, LLC. So a movie with all these partners. I wasn't expecting, like, they were changing percentages and stuff, and people were joining and leaving, and yep. I thought, That's common, oh, God. right? Was like, a movie and LLC. And was like, okay. You were like, okay, this might be, like, you know, people specialize in this. And I was like, okay, it doesn't sound that difficult. It wasn't that difficult. You know the part that was difficult? It was getting the people to actually figure out when they changed percentages. Mm-hmm. Then it turned out one person who didn't know they lost their percentages, and then their lawyer wanted to draw up an agreement that he exchanged theirs for an upfront money agreement, and they got me involved this whole time. And I'm like, and then, no, I don't do this. I don't do this. So four times I dropped my life to prepare the return for them, and four times it was done not the way the woman wanted it done, who was having the lawyer drop stuff. So I wasted all the time, and I'm like, you guys acted like this was an emergency. No, I thought my job to make up an agreement of who, you know, who's partners and when you're switching shares and upfront money agreements. That's not even part of the tax return. Like, no. And what did and you What did you learn from that? I learned that I need to. Well, just, I got to tell you though. Huh? Sometimes it happened. I finally said, this is not my business. I don't do this. I don't think with this particular situation, I could have done anything else except, except saying that. Right. Um, I think that even if I had said, I will only do this now once, you've asked me to drop things so many times, I think this particular situation, it wouldn't have helped. I had two very, very nervous contact people who just wanted everything now and, and were constantly texting me. And it. But... I know that in the future with normal situations, I will be like, I only do the tax return. Everything else must be complete before you come to me. If you need a consult before about any questions you have, or if you need help with the bookkeeping, then make sure you're doing it right. I only do the tax return. That's my job. And they, they might have known, though, Beth, you are an attorney or were an attorney, right? So I don't know if they got wind of that maybe and they they somehow knew. No, they didn't, and I actually was very clear. I have to be because in, I'm licensed in New York, but if I practice at all, I have to do CLE credit and it costs a lot of money. Gotcha. And so I am I am very clear with anybody. I am not an attorney that is practicing anywhere. And so I actually told them that even though they didn't know I was an attorney because I was like, listen, guys, I you're treading me on an area I can't go in because – so it was like kind of my other way of trying to say, hey, I can't be involved in this. Right. I was trying every single way to tell them. Yeah, you got a lot of angles to, to how to say no. It, so, it, it, it did not work. did not work. It, yeah, it, it rarely I, does with the uh, the herding cat partnerships are always um, when uh, people understand two, you know, two totally different or more, more than two totally different things from the same words. It's uh, It gets interesting. So I think the... Your, the fact that you were in law school, you're in New York City, 
and kind of then you 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 end up in the tax business. How did you get into becoming an attorney and why did you get out of that field? Well, I actually <laughs> When I was in fifth grade, my uncle was an attorney, and I mentioned to a couple boys in fifth grade that I was going to be an attorney. And I, under, I had somehow understood what an attorney was. It was like I was good at very logical arguments. I was also very good at masculine qualities. I don't think I understood that at fifth grade, but you know that people traditionally think are masculine qualities: being blunt, being forward, being analytical, being you know pragmatic. And again, I don't think they're male qualities necessarily, but at the time, and um, they told me that I couldn't be a lawyer because I'm a woman. Hmm. I'm a girl. Wow. And I said, I said, what? And I mean, you have to, that's weird, right? I'm 49. Like, but, like, but it was still very prevalent when I was young. So wow. I, I said, well, okay, great. I'm going to be a lawyer. And, you know, everything we see in the media and everything people say to us, we think it's going to be so much different than it is. A lot is a lot of boring stuff. It's a lot of sitting behind a desk, doing drudgery work, um, and I don't think I considered that because I was like, that's not the person I am. That's not what I'm going to, you know, that's not what I'm cut out for. So I I went to, you know, great college. I went to law school in New York City at Fordham. I graduated. I passed the bar. But in my third year of law school, I really early on, I was like, I don't think I can do this. I, I I'm starting to see exactly what this is. Because what did it was the interviews with the law firms, and just I mean, honestly, some of them just seem so miserable. Right. <laughs> and usually, you're interviewed. You're 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 interviewed by you know, you know, second year associates, and you know that's and, and I just have to say, I was like, wow, these people look dead in, in the eye. <laughs> and then you know, and then and then I had a couple people um, who I you know met who you know, were first year associates from the year before and they're like, Oh yeah, I'm working, you know, a hundred hours. Oh, you have to bill every minute of your time and Where do I sign? <laughs> I, my, and my my anxiety like went through the roof and I'm not even joking. Like I I was like, Oh my God, I have to come for every minute of my time and and I'm a people pleaser, so I'm, I'm like, I'm gonna be in big trouble. Like so I after law school, I still just didn't understand, like, what should I do? What direction should I go in? So hmm. I did some litigation research. Oh, it was awful. Um, I did some, you know, working at a law firm. At one point, I finally said, oh, let me see if I can office manage a small law firm. And I just watched these guys, and I'm like, I don't want to do this. This is awful. <laughs> and so at the time, I had met someone in law school who was a ad executive, and she had said to me, you know What's your personality or anything? I think she's interacting, and I laugh. I was like, <laughs> right. I'm not one of those people that runs around going, I'm a thespian. That's ridiculous. <laughs> but didn't you grow up, you said your dad was a lawyer? No, my uncle was. Your, my dad was a oh, computer gotcha. consultant. Oh, gotcha. Like, software and stuff like that. And so it was very funny because I, I just was, no, I'm not creative. I grew up in... I was smart, so you guys got pushed in that direction. No, I'm not creative. I mean, I had never had anybody encourage creativity in me, ever. Hmm. So I was just like, no, 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 that's not. I, I thought it was hilarious. And then I just realized how miserable I was, so I was like, you know what? I don't know if she's right, but eh. So I took an acting class, and then I was discovered by a hair care line in Canada. I became their primary model. I started taking classes, and I booked, a very, after a couple of years, I booked a very, very large commercial campaign that paid very well, and I was like, you know what? <laughs> I, can't, I can't go back to law. I don't know what to do. And so I was done with New York City, and I was like, well, the only other place to do commercials would be Los Angeles. So I, uh, I moved out here, loved the sunshine, so much better for my anxiety and disposition, and I was still floundering. I was like, okay, well, because we, we had a commercial strike when I first arrived, so oh, there was no. no work. Perfect timing, and yeah. So, <laughs> and within the first year, I, I just happened to see this thing at Screen Actors Guild, and it said, do you want to learn how to do your taxes? Actors have unique situations with expenses. And I was like, I don't because I, I do not like large public gatherings at all. And I was like, okay, fine. So I went. And I still remember I was in sweats and this really baggy T-shirt. I looked like a like a little like street urchin. And, I thought um, you were going to say you looked like a tax preparer. 
<laughs> well, now, yeah, right. So I was just sitting there and I was listening and I was like, okay, and, you know, I, I, I thought it was fascinating a little bit, but because of my background and how law school has learned how to think, which was invaluable, I would never take the education back, I, I asked afterwards, I asked some very pointed questions. I went up and I was like, and it's funny, I don't know what possessed me because normally I'd be like, oh my God, there's 20 people waiting for this person. I don't know why I feel it. So it has nothing to do with not being bold or not being willing to do it. It's just like, oh God, I don't want to deal with 20 people and waiting. And But I waited and I asked him some questions and he just kind of looked at me and he says, I think you have a brain for this. And I'm like, excuse me? And he said, would you want to learn how to do taxes? And I was skeptical, right? I was like, well, why? Why me? You have all these people here. For whatever reason, I decided to take a chance, and it still surprises me to this day. And I went into his office, and he supervised my returns, and I could ask him questions if I didn't, I was worried about things, but I was really good at it very quickly. Yeah, I could, I could see that being true, yeah. And, and having a mentor there, right, it really made a difference for you, I would think. Well, and I, and I liked it. And you have to remember, at the time, then the strike was over, and you have to remember, at the time, it was only supplemental income. Right. So, you know, so there wasn't as much risk of, like, jumping in, right? I just had a really good situation. Um, but then when I've been doing it for, like, I want to say, I think I've been at the, there, I think my six full years, I just started realizing there's nothing else to learn here. There's just nothing else to learn, and I'm giving away half of the money I'm making, and I have too many clients. So, you know, yes, I was, you know, 50% to pay for a receptionist just wasn't working for me anymore. Gotcha. You know, I was like, okay, well, yes, I have an I, I get it. I have the office. I have the receptionist, but the other main point was, oh, and we, you know, get you clients because we have a great reputation. I'm like, okay, but I have overskill my clients have recommended so many people that you guys are getting that benefit. And they didn't, they didn't see it that way, which is fine. And, um, they said, well, you started here and all your clients are a source of us. So I was like, Oh, come on. How long are we going to do that? You know what I mean? I'm like, and, that, and that happens a lot. I mean, in our type of business, right there, you have your, your apprenticeship stage, you know, that the people go through and then learning. And a lot of times we end, you know, randomly kind of end up in the business, uh, surprising actually how many stories are, are like yours. Um, but then you reach that point where you're not, you know, maybe, you know, learning and growing as much and, uh, and you look financially, maybe it's becoming more of a main, the main source of income. And that, that other 50% starts to, you know, look pretty appealing and it could be pretty difficult to navigate kind of that next stage of your career. Well, and, um, I'm a good person. I am an ethical person. So, I was really betwixt in between because even though I thought it was ridiculous to say that all of these referrals over six years that have referred other people and other people like out of the branches of the tree, right? Right. They all belong to them because they referred the, they gave me the first client, you right. know, six years ago. I was like, where does that stop? Because at this point, I'm giving you guys more clients because I can't do them all. And so I was like, you know, I don't. I was very, very. I know the hairdressers a lot of times have this situation, yes. like leaving a salon and stuff. And there, another girl had left this place, and what she had done, unfortunately, she did it under the cover at night, and then she kind of sent all of her clients a letter saying, you should come with me, and, and you know, and I was like, okay. Uh -oh. I knew that, really, they were really upset about that. So what happened was the last year I was there, they tried to get us to sign a non-compete clause, and I, I said, well, we're independent contractors. You don't provide any benefits. You can't have us not compete you don't have that right you're not our boss and it became this huge thing like you know they wanted to protect themselves and i'm like but we show up every day we do this work and we're not your employees we give you a percentage like a commission but we are entirely responsible for anything that goes wrong you know obviously you just have to have a rudimentary understanding of law to understand if you're an independent contractor and they're not your boss they can't make you do a non-compete clause yeah, and I think in, in California, you can't even really do that successfully with, with employees too much. Didn't make any sense. How, who, you know, I'm going to not compete against myself. I mean, it's just so, I ended up getting very, very sick. My Crohn's flared that winter, really sick, hospital sick. 
Wow. And um, I just was like, it just again, good timing. I was like, you know what? I don't have the luxury of giving away 50% of my tax money. I don't. I haven't been able to work. I haven't been right. able to, you know, the recession happened. You know, it was starting to happen. I was like, I don't have the luxury. And so I left and true to my word, even though all my clients had my personal business card with my phone number on it, I did not contact one person, not one. And I was like, you know, I really felt ethically, I really didn't like what the last girl did. And I didn't have the chance, unfortunately, to tell my clients I might be leaving. But I did mention that, you know, I may go out on my own one day. You know, I, I'm thinking that, you know, I've learned enough. So I was like, you know what? I just have to trust. It's either it's going to work out the way it's going to You know, I had been so sick. kind of changed your perspective. Interesting. So, Beth, what, back up real quick. So your Hollywood side was giving you, your acting was providing half your income? Or at this point it was dwindling down? I used to do commercials. And, you know, I made for a decade, I had health insurance and made, you know, an average of $45,000 a year. Nice. So you were in the guild and that was kind of like your main income and you were doing the tax stuff as kind of a stabilizer or to kind of fill out your income. Yeah. And then what prompted you to make that change where you finally left? Like what was the main catalyst? It was the, the recession in 2008. I basically... Uh, women in my category, there were so many of them and there were so many fewer jobs and the jobs paid a third of the money. I mean, you look at any of the statistics, it's just, it wasn't a viable, you couldn't make a living at it anymore. Right. I can show you the tax clients that I have now out of the 30 that made a living at it. You know, I think I've one that still does. Mm. It just, everything changed and you had to have another plan. And I just happened to be lucky enough to have gotten sick at the time when that move would be the most beneficial. But that's what I'm trying to understand. Cause like if your main source was gone or, or was dwindling quickly, it wasn't gone yet. It wasn't, it gone, wasn't yet. gone yet. Okay. So, so what happens is basically over time. So the recession hit and then it became, okay, this year I made half as much as I used to. And then the next year it was, I made 30% as much. Cause you have to remember we would get residuals. So if you, had commercials that were running, you could still sometimes float a year or two beyond when you last shot at the uh, time. Okay. So I still had money coming in, but when the auditions are drying up, it took some time to catch up with people. Gotcha. You know, not, not having auditions, having too much competition for a lot of jobs went non-union. And in screen actors, people cannot do non-union work. So it, it became this thing where people were fighting like, I would go out, you know, I'd have five auditions a month, you know, let's say. And then I was fighting like crazy to get one. You can't, having 12 to 14 auditions a year, I mean, the average good booker books one out of 25. I mean, just do the math. Yeah, you just, right. You know, it's not sustainable. That's what I'm trying to understand. How did you go from my main source is drying up, but then I'm also going to quit the backup plan? Well, I didn't necessarily quit. It phased out on its own. That's the interesting part. I could not have possibly predicted how bad it would get for commercial actors. I did not know. I thought it might bounce back. I was handling the immediate. Like, I am I was very sick. I don't want to have to go into an office every day. I need some flexibility. And you know what? I need that other half of the money. Yes. Right. You know, I can make 14 grand or I can make almost 30 grand. Like, right. Which, and so I saw the writing on the wall for at least a little while. And since I had been so sick, I was like, you know, I guess, you know, this is the best option right now. And I remember thinking to myself, I hate this because I've always thought of myself as an actor and I don't want acting to become a hobby because my life has always been acting is my main job, taxes is a side thing. Hmm. And this move is going to make it a main thing for a while. Right. And... I didn't want that to happen. I'm not going to lie. I mean, I love acting. I wanted to keep doing commercials, but when the industry changes, it changes. It's never gone back. It's actually gotten much worse in terms of getting auditions. So while I'm very sad that, you know, I couldn't sustain it and that, you know, I, I don't really even call myself an actor anymore because it phased out so much. I think that that was a little bit hard to let go because I was so good at it. I really enjoyed it. And it's hard when an industry changes so much that there's no way to do what you were doing. You know, right. it's just gone. That opportunity is gone. And, and it was part of your identity too, right? It was part of how you 
showed up in the world. So that's, that's always a difficult thing to let go of and change kind of who you are. And it's your focus, you know, like I had found the things I loved about it. I found a routine. I, I creative. I was never creative before. And so it was a bummer, you know, to, that's a, probably a small word to say, but like <laughs> I said, cause I had been so sick, I think it required something of me. You know, I just had to like bite the bullet. You know what I mean? Like I was like, okay, I just, I have to, I need the money. I need, you know, we don't know what's happening with recession. I need the money. Because I had been so sick, I had not been doing well in auditions and everything. So I think that part was well-timed because it was right before this full recession hit. So I had already had a stop to my career and not just the recession changing everything. Right. So for me, it it gave me a little extra time to realize, oh my God, we're all like not in a great place, right? So this whole COVID-19 thing is, is kind of a, a little bit of a replay uh, in a certain way, in terms of um, those of us that have been through these economic crashes before, or these humongous career changes. And I mean, it's it's kind of like, um, uh, not that you feel comfortable in this current very difficult situation, but it's it's probably like you kind of do have a unique perspective on it, given the, the things you've already, you know, went through. Well, it's, it's interesting because I assume that you guys also have experienced this. You have depending on what kind of tax person you are. Some people just take the information, don't ask questions, right, you know, right. they, they, they turn out as much as they can. I am a, I call myself a teaching tax preparer. I go through every single thing on the tax return people so that they can actually understand it because I started wanting to do it because it empowered people to understand their finances. Cool. So I'm there through buying and selling houses, right. foreclosures, losing a child, right. doing in vitro, like all those things are discussed, you know, on tax returns. I've known wow. people before they had babies, and now they have kids who are 13. Right. You know, it's one of my uh, years at the old place. Uh, there was this little boy who came in, Cyrus, and he was three, and I shared Valentine's candy with me. And he he was so sweet, and he gave me a hug, and he asked me to be his Valentine. And so I started taking him on play dates. He just graduated from high school. So awesome. I, you know, so I've been there for... A lot, right? Like, it's weird. So I'm watching these people all scramble. Yeah, and exactly. I've always had a hard time with clients who've been with me 15 years and then suddenly disappear. Don't say goodbye, nothing. That's really hard for me because I do get to know them so well. And I will admit, I wish I were better about being like, well, whatever. But 15 years, I talk to them about stuff that they don't talk to their best friends about half the time. Yep. And so when they just disappear, it's hard. But this year, because people are so crazy, it's happened more often, where people I never thought would leave me are just disappeared into thin air. Like, if, and you're just like, okay. Uh, people writing and saying, you know, I'm going to try to do my taxes on my own because I don't know when I'm going to get my next paycheck. Yeah. That happened a lot more in April before the unemployment thing, you know, was settled or whatever. Now it's crazy again. But, um, but it, it was really, I watched people freak the heck out. I don't know about you guys, but, you know, in, in late March, early April, when they were still, like, deciding, if you recall, they said, oh, we're going to extend the deadline for paperwork, but that doesn't mean we're going to extend it for money. So, people, I had 20 million emails. I don't understand. I don't understand. And, like, and I was like, okay, well, they haven't made a decision about the money. I can't really give you advice on that. Well, what's the point? I have to do the paperwork to tell them how much money I owe. And, you know, it's just like people panicking. And it took them another, like, two weeks to say, okay, fine, the money is delayed as well. And then I had a whole new wave of emails. And since I'm the only person and there's 200 clients, it was crazy pants. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And especially when you're in very close, you, you could say, like, relationship contact with where you are on that getting on that deeper level with people. Sometimes the emotional uh, side of that, it's taxing in a extreme way. And this tax season, I mean, I know, I know that was what it was like for us dealing with our clients. I mean, seeing people, uh, you know, lose 90% of their income overnight or, you know, get laid off from jobs they've had for a long time, have to close their restaurants and, and everything else. And so, yeah, definitely that, that relationship part of it and the, um, just the, the taxing part of it. And then also 
like you said, Beth, all the extensions that have been filed where it kind of hasn't ended. And so I wonder if like, as we, I believe we just have about 10 minutes left, but I wanted to see if we could touch on a very important topic, which is your dogs. So the, I know that we had bonded about, uh, we, we both have two, uh, smaller dogs that are like a big part of, you know, the, the work environment and the de-stress and the keep good energy. Um, what are those, what do those guys mean to you and how do they fit into your, uh, your career as a tax professional? Well, I obviously work from home and I, my clients come to my place, um, or they do it over the phone. It depends on how they feel this year, obviously. Holy moly, right? Right. <laughs> Change of plans for sure. Five years ago, I just realized that I was just, you know, working from home. It just felt like there was no, I was kind of untethered and yeah, I just there. knew I needed a change. And I loved living alone. I don't have a problem with that, but I just, I just felt like, you know what? I could give a home to a dog. I've never had a dog. And I grew up being afraid of dogs because I got bit. So I was like, you know what? I'll get a dog, a sweet dog, and, you know, I'll take care of it. But my one caveat with that was it needs to be a dog. If they're going to give back to me, I want a dog that needs me. So I looked for a special needs dog. And I found Oliver. And Oliver um, had uncontrollable diabetes. It also turned out once I got him from the rescue, he had a thyroid issue, which I fought valiantly to get treated he would have died if we hadn't treated it. Wow. And um, mm. he had se- severe dry eye. He, um, like, to the point, ulcers on the cornea. He's blind. And he's also a fight dog. Like, a fight or flight dog. He, like, every dog has a choice when, like, they're confronted with something. Okay. Oliver, he's blind and everything, he will actually not back down. <laughs> it was crazy. I was like, dude, you're blind? You're 14 pounds. What is, what is your deal? <laughs> and, um... And so he um, he came home with me. It was the most... I got him in August because I figured that gave me enough time to settle in for tax season, right, the following year. Yeah, get him and broken in for getting prepared for tax season. I There were many tears, many times, because then I found out his diabetes was uncontrolled. He was miserable. Then mm. I There were so many vet visits. Then I realized, oh, my God, his thyroid is failing. So I had to go to specialists and figure that out. And the rescue was great. They provided the cash to do that. But it was still a lot of personal time, energy. And the first time I gave him his shot, he bit me. Mm. So he has two shots a day for insulin. I know. It was very ambitious, guys. I know. And, uh, and so he bit me, and I was like, I have to give him back. I don't know what to do. I was like, oh, my God. It was the first time I had ever hit the feeling and really couldn't figure a way around it. Interesting. Like, I was just like, oh, my God, I, I, there's nothing else I can do. He bit me. I'm terrified now. I still can't explain to you how it worked. I don't know. But um, it, there were, like I said, a lot of crying, a lot of very close to having me give him back. But a lot of it was maybe I'm just not the right person for him because I, I can't handle this. Look at me. I, he bit me, and I'm freaking out. And, it, and now he's my best friend. And the only problem we have during tax season is that he doesn't like nobody's here this year and so therefore he wants me and i'm like no no, no i gotta work i gotta work and he doesn't understand that there's no one here so sounds he's... like kids <laughs> exactly right it's crazy i feel like i have two toddlers so 10 months later i i had fostered a dog for four days and it was so rewarding i took him until he'd go to his new mommy and he's a very happy dog he flew up to oregon with uh pilots pause pilots or and so I was like, you know what? That went so well. I also like that dog, so maybe I should look at a second dog. And, of course, me and my infinite wisdom was like, you know, we'll just look for the one that needs us. Well, I basically ended up going to a shelter that was closing up, the rescue shelter was closing, and the one dog nobody would take was a little chihuahua who was a nipper because she had been trapped in a box for a long time. Mm. So, yes, yeah, a biter, I know. So I was like... <laughs> I it's not a bite, though. Bite. It's just a nip, right? That's what they always say about the... Yeah, well, like, yeah but it's got so sharp like, teeth, though, and it just bit... I'm pretty sure it just bit me. Wow, it hurt. <laughs> yeah, because um, the nip, it can, it, it can... There's different levels of a nip where it's like, it, you well, know... Well, I know, but so they basically, I basically was the last one there. They were closing at 7. It was 7.10. Nobody was there, and I said, well, what's going to happen to her? And they're like, we're going to take her to the shelter tomorrow. 
Well, I know, they said, well, it's no-kill. And I said, okay, but no-kill means no healthy adoptable dog. The minute she nips at someone, they're going to put her down. Hmm. So they were very like, well, you know, we don't have anybody to take her, and that's just what has to happen. And I'm like, okay. So I'm basically really her last chance. And I just couldn't leave. So I walked out of that darn place with two freaking biting dogs. How did that happen? So now I have, so she has behavioral stuff. She won't. On a leash, she lunges at every dog, so walking them is an obstacle. Think about that. Think about how silly I look. I've got one dog that I have to make sure doesn't walk into stuff, and because he's a diabetic, he tries to eat everything on the ground. On the other hand, I've got a a dog in a residential neighborhood with a lot of dogs that lunges at every dog she sees. Is it optimal course? And I look like an idiot. I'm not going to lie. Well, gr- for me, <laughs> so, for me, Beth, growing up in L.A., that's like, you know, that's a classic L.A. story right there, and that fits right in. <laughs> um <laughs> for from being a native but but i do i do see what you mean it can be uh it can result in some adventures while you're walking your dogs for sure oh my goodness it's crazy you can't like and then you walk one because the other one's at the vet or something and you're just like oh my god this is so easy so these two have saved me i have not felt lonely during covid i have not felt unloved every day at least 20 times i stopped to tell these guys how much i love them and how much i appreciate them they're my heart and Aww. COVID's taken a lot from a lot of people, and I think that's one of the main takeaways for me with my tax business is I, because of how my tax business is built, I'm seeing that not just in the lives of the people, my family, my close friends, but I'm seeing it in the lives of people who I consider my family, my yeah, tax family, Right. and it's heartbreaking. You're just seeing the damage it's doing, and I don't know about you guys, but sometimes during a tax appointment, I would get information I wouldn't necessarily get from, you know, just what we were discussing on the tax return, like finding out someone's parent died and they couldn't be there, that, you know, someone's brother was in the hospital and they couldn't go, someone's friend had COVID and no one was allowed in, and that breaks your heart. You just listen and people cry and you're just like, oh, I don't, what can I offer, you know? Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting that you say that, Beth, because I, I think it's, what you are offering by being there and having, you know, think about all the people that are going around right now without anybody to confide in, in that way, uh, you know, what you're already providing, um, you know, by giving that safe space and be able to have people express themselves like that, those moments really matter for people. So, I mean, we, we kind of been struggling with some of the same things you're talking about. And I'm just trying to really focus on the positive side of it of even if it's just like we hear somebody out hear what they're going through and are able to identify with them and say hey um you know we're in this together to some degree i think that's extremely valuable and uh, i think it does make a difference so um, i know your clients uh, appreciate that about you and i know our our community and everything you do in in our groups and um you, you definitely bring that vibe to the uh, to the situation so it, it does matter you know in, in my humble opinion I think that I started my business with caring about, and they all knew, I cared about how their finances were the way they are, which affects every area of your life, right? And I think they all know that to a certain extent. And I'm a firm believer in, you know, I'm not going to give you platitudes. Yeah, this sucks. You got ripped off. It's a bad hand to be dealt. And I can make sure all that you're worrying about about this tax return, I promise you, they're all things I can manage, and you just need to trust me and let it go. Don't worry about it, because a lot of them, that's just an added burden, you know, because totally. money is so crazy, and and, and I, I'm very, I've always been very proactive about telling my clients, like, okay, I understand. They'll give me, like, 20 million questions up front, and I'll be like, okay, all of it will be solved. Every single question will be hit. I go exactly in the same order so that every question gets handled, and I promise you, we got this. Like, you know, just just breathe. And that's been much, much more helpful to people than, I mean, it's always been helpful, but much more helpful now because right. so many people come into the, re- the return with, oh my God, I'm going to owe money. And I'm, gonna, and I'm like, okay. Right, right. And even, even if that's the case, we can manage this and I can give you options. And I think that that's been always been one of my best qualities, probably as a tax preparer, is that even though I'm high strung and chatty and everything in you know normal life, even that that I bring to my tax, every single client has, I would, can feel it, and I can tell you like half my clients have told me, you just, 
because you're so unstressed and unfazed by taxes, and you're like, oh, it's going to get handled. Don't worry. It's so it's such a good environment because cool. I don't stress anymore. I'm like, oh, Beth will handle it. And because most of what they stress about is just the process that we already go through, you know? So I'm like, okay, well, you know, and it's going to handle it. I know this thing. You aren't asking me to manage a multi-million dollar corporation. Calm down. <laughs> And I think my candor, my pragmatism, and just that sense that, no, I got this. No, nope, I'm not worried. See, I'm not worried has provided a lot for people and even more right now. Because I know this thing. I've been doing it 20 years. None of you are coming in and, like, reinventing the wheel for me. A lot of what they're worried about, they don't realize is easily manageable. And my job is to make sure that they know that. And just hilarious to me, though, how many people tell me, well, you're just so relaxed about it and so unafraid of the whole process that it makes me calm. And I'm like, funny, right? That I'm normally so high strung about everything, right? <laughs> and all of them know me so, like, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like reverse psychology. You got them off balance, yet yet perfectly in balance and uh, enjoying their experience. So, yeah, we really appreciate the the interview with you, Beth, and and being able to hear uh, hear your story, kind of how you got into the business, your background, and uh, and also some really nice to see you appreciating like what you're doing for people. Like I said, you know, I know sometimes when I when I try to encourage people, um, you know, as tax pros, sometimes we, I think we we underestimate how important that we actually can be to to the lives of these clients. And so good to hear you kind of appreciate what you're doing for people, especially during this uh, very challenging time. And um, yeah, just just appreciate having you on the show. And anything you wanted to add to wrap it up. No, I think that you hit the nail on the head. Like, everybody is in this to a certain extent together. Some people have harder challenges. Some people have lesser challenges. But everybody needs empathy and compassion. And I'm good at that. So why not make sure you incorporate that into all your conversations? You know? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. The more the more that we have of that, Beth, in the world, the, be, the better off we're all going to be. And so, yeah, I just appreciate you putting out putting out those vibes and, and helping your clients in the way that you do. And uh, I'm sure we'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much, Andy and Jeff. Uh, Roka and Oliver say goodbye as well. That's right. I, 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 t- I told you we were going to bring them up, you know, because I, I got the two small dogs myself that are my work at home buddies as well. So I wanted to make sure, you know, they got a proper spotlight on them as well. Thanks so much, Beth. 